going on breaking brown family what is going on today is everyone doing good as everyone has their libations your water your chamomile whatever it takes right now for you to feel okay um and and kind of relax for this conversation that we're going to have i feel a little hoarse for some reason i don't feel like i've been talking that much but i i feel a little hoarse um Anyway, what's going on, fam? What's going on, Marvin, Todd? What's going on, um, Joanne? What's going on, Bakara? What's up, fam? What's going on, everybody in the chat? We have to have a conversation today. And I didn't want to even broach this subject again anytime soon. But, I, you know, it's funny. Like, even after Trump said we're going to let the, the, the migrant children and we're going to reconnect them to their people, we still have this. Well, what's the process, Trump? How are we going to get the babies back to the mamas and the mamas back to the babies? So I, I, I think what made me kind of want to have the conversation, um, I had a few people send me emails and send me, um, somebody sent me a tweet, which basically went into how, how um, Reverend Al Sharpton was basically kind of making things the same which aren't the same. So that's the conversation that we're going to have today. What I want to do, please like if you haven't liked the video. Please subscribe if you haven't subscribed to the channel. Please hit that bell so that you know when I'm on. Please share this, you know, with your friends. Um, please go to subscribe to brown.com and just add your name to the email list so that I just have it on file in case something goes down here. Um, I know, and I know last week, and I don't know if it's still going on, I'm getting different stories from different people. But if you have an iPhone, I know what it was doing is if you tried to play it on your mobile, it would play for like maybe maybe a minute and a half, two minutes, because I have an iPhone too, and it did the same thing with me. And then you would play it for a little while, and it would just it would just say stream ended. Um, so I sent that to YouTube, and they're elevating the request, and they sent me back an email to ask some more questions about encoding or whatever I got to get back to. So if you had that issue on your mobile, it doesn't seem to be an issue on your laptop, but if you had it or your, or your MacBook, but if you had it on your mobile, I'm aware of it, um, trying to fix it. Um, but it is what it is, and we just gonna keep it. We just gonna keep it moving. That's what we do. We don't let one, one, one nobody don't stop no show. We keeps it moving around here. So I want to, the clip I saw, I can only address what I saw. Some people told me about Reverend Al Sharpton's radio show. I didn't hear the radio show part, but I watched Politics Nation. That's his Sunday show. You remember he used to have a show he did all week, but after when it was, when it was time for Obama to go, it was time for all of the Negro whisperers to go home. So the only one they let stick, stick around for one day on Sunday was uh, Al Sharpton. So I watched that, and he basically tried to give black people a lesson in how we were just like the migrants at the border, which was actually just a lesson in how ignorant Al Sharpton is. Um, and I always have called Al Sharpton a street preacher without a church. You know, you call yourself a reverend, but where is your church with your thousands of members? I don't, I don't, I don't, under, I never really understood that. And I always avoid, I like real pastors who understand and love people. I don't like street preachers who preach at the corners of streets. You see a lot of that in New York, just people who, just people with Bibles and all kinds of stuff and strange teachings. He's a street preacher without a church. So I have never, I have always been very, very, very wary of Mr. Sharpton. And so what we're seeing today Break it around, family. What we are seeing today is the culmination of a lot of our bad decisions. See, because it's real easy to come in here, right? It's real easy to come in here and just blame Al Sharpton. Oh, I can't believe Al Sharpton said that. Oh, man, Yvette. Wow, he said that. Man, that brother lost. It's real easy to come in here and say that to me and not own the fact that, like, I've been here for a minute. And like when I tried to criticize Al Sharpton a while ago, when I tried to criticize and tell y'all during the early stages of the Obama administration, first term, when I tried to tell y'all that Al Sharpton wasn't built for this, he wasn't even built to play at this level, when I tried to tell everybody that, listen, the fact that Obama chose Al Sharpton to be the surrogate for black people, the fact that he did that is a, is, is a tea leaf to show you how he feels and that he doesn't take us or our interests seriously. When I tried to tell you that in terms of how Jesse Jackson, Reverend Jesse Jackson was sidelined, and a lot of people like to say, well, no, they're just the same. Jesse and Al, no, 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 no. People don't know about, if you, if you read, there's a great um, 
there's a great book by Dr. Adolph Reed about Jesse Jackson, Reverend Jesse Jackson, and you know, it, it, as as with all things, Adolph Reed, Dr. Adolph Reed is is critical. Adolph's critical of everything. He's critical of waking up. But you know, he's a great thinker. Whether or not you agree with him, and you got to get into a space where you can read people that you don't always agree with. But he talks about in that book about the 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 concession that the concessions that Reverend Jesse Jackson got. Um, and, and if you all don't know, you can go on to my page or my Twitter page. Um, I'll, we'll be at Simmons College. We're doing stuff with St. Stephen's and Reverend Jackson will be there. And we'll, you know, hopefully have some conversations about the African-American designation and some other stuff. But what you have to understand is that Reverend Jesse Jackson got concessions and was working to get concessions from Mondale because of the showing that he got in terms of running for president. So that's another story for another day. Um, but... These two things are not the same, is what I'm trying to tell you. Like, you, you have to understand that, and you have to be able to assess Al Sharpton and what he brings to the table and what he doesn't bring to the table. You can be a rabble rouser in your own community, and I respect rabble rousers. I think I do my own share of rabble rousing here, but... That does not mean that you are fit or built or have the have the capacity to 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 operate on the level that you need to operate on to sit down with presidents, to sit down with people who have money and going to influence you. That doesn't mean that you have what it takes. And what I'm saying is, when people ask me for a solution, people love to watch my videos and say, "Listen, Yvette, you talk a lot, but where are the solutions?" No, the problem isn't that I don't have solutions. The problem is that you don't like my solutions. So just be honest. You're not ready to do this stuff. You just want somebody to tell you that you're going to make a million dollars tomorrow. And that's who you're going to ride with. You don't want to ride with me because my solutions are kind of hard. And they, wanna, they make your life harder because they make you read more and do more. So, so what I'm telling you is that the fact that we got Reverend Al Sharpton as our surrogate was a problem in terms of how we assessed him and how we assessed how he was built. He was never built to be on that level. Al ain't on that level. He never been built to be on that level. But we let him be on that level. And when I said, this brother ain't built for this, I can see how people are built. Like, you know, I, it, it, you know like, like building robots. He ain't built for this. He ain't ready for this. He don't have the integrity for this. Okay? I understand what that means. There's a lot of shysterism going on in the community. And one of the things that I like to do is I like to call out shysterism. If I see a shyster, I call it. And if you want to debate me about whether or not a person is a shyster, I invite it. Please debate me. But see, what you have to do, though, you have to debate me on the merits. Let me give you an example. I called in. If you haven't checked it out, check out Antonio Moore's show, show from Friday about Jay Morrison. Now, I don't have any problem with anybody debating me about him. That's perfectly reasonable for you to do that. But you need to debate me about the SEC filing. You need to debate me. You need to tell me, well, why 8% um, uh, is, 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 is as a fee is a good thing and, and how this going to be and how is this going to be used. And you need to debate me. Well, Yvette, I've researched some other filings that are similar, and this is what they did. And so if they did it, he can do it. And this is the comparison. We need to have that kind of back and forth. What you cannot do. And what you should not do as a grown, as a person who pretends to be a grown person, what you should not do is get in my comments and say, Vet, you just a hater. You don't like nobody and you're trying to build nothing and so you just don't like builders. And I don't know what's wrong with you. See, that lets me know you don't even know how to engage me. There's a way to debate me. I know how to debate me. I'm not saying... I'm not saying you'll necessarily win, but there's a way to look at that and try to come away with something. There's a way to comparatively look at different SEC filings and the potential of this fund versus the potential of other funds versus different outcomes. There is a way to do it. But the way to do it is not to come to me and just to tell me I'm a hater because I actually did my due diligence and you're caught up on aspirationalism as a religion that's not the way to debate me and every time you come into the comments and you do that you make yourself look like you know a slow person so there's nothing I can say about that so but but in terms of solutions one of the solutions that we have to engage 
is to understand how we have to pick our leaders and what we have to go through in terms of making assessments in terms of who's a good leader and who's not a good leader. And we got to switch these people out quick. If you determine that you put somebody in place and that person is not a good leader and you had them wrong, I messed up, switch them out. You switch them out like old shoes. We have to be able to do that. That is, that is a solution. People love to ask me for solutions, but people never love to hear the solution or get involved in terms of enacting the solution in their own communities. Yeah, you want to ask me something, but you don't want to follow the person who is your legislator on Twitter and just like tweet the person. Like, what's up with this? Why'd you support this? Why'd you do that? Forget, even before you go to the town hall, we live in an era where you can engage somebody online. You can, you can, you can follow the shade room, can't you? And you can know everything that goes on and post thousands of comments on the shade room, but you can't post no comment to your to your local legislator, to your to your state, you know, state house, to, to the person who represents you there. Even your governor. You can't do that, but you can follow them and you can tell me who getting buried this week. You can tell me all kind of weird stuff. So let's first of all, if you want to ask solutions, that's one solution. And and it's let me just say this before I go any further. It goes further than just I'm going to get into your boy Rev Al. But before we get into him, I just want to say, like, even how we assess things. I saw so many assessments of how the BET Awards were wonderful last night. And Jamie Foxx did a wonderful job. And I'm just trying to figure out what's wrong with my people. Like, understand something. He brought Michael B. Jordan onto the stage. And, and, and before that, he was like, yeah, you did the Crip Rock and you was gangsta. I thought you was gang. You was gang and you was doing that and you were, I wanted the Crip Rock and that was, I thought you was. And it was like, do you understand the Killmonger? Michael B. Jordan's character went to like a top tier engineering school. Do you understand that his character was, was, was trained by JSOC, which is an elite fighting, which is an elite military force in America. Do you understand that his character was so single-minded that he decided that early on that he was going to, he was going to fight for people in America, for black Americans who, and, 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 and black people all, all outside, black people everywhere, black liberation everywhere. He was going to be true what Pan-Africanists say they want to do. He was going to do it. Do you understand that? And then you invite him on stage and you talk about crip walking and everybody seems okay. Like everybody's like, yeah, well, that makes sense. How? How? How does that make sense? And how did everybody say that was great? You devalued that character. You minimized that character. And you were just babbling on stage. You didn't really have no, you didn't really have no rhyme or reason. You just kind of invited Donald Glover on stage and he was in his pajamas look like. And you invited him on stage and y'all was singing on stage. And it was just like you were just doing random stuff. And how does it how, how is everybody okay with like the BET Wars just random? There is no rhyme or reason that this is gonna happen first, second, or third. And we're going to get the rights to Black Panther to put up this image. And we're, we're going to really do it right. We're going to have this image and we're going to use a Black Panther song. And we're going to pay for those rights. Like what you saw was that the BET ain't got no money. Because the only thing, they could, only thing the BET could afford, hear me, the only thing they could afford was Jamie Foxx. That's all they could afford. They couldn't afford none of that other stuff. So we're going to get Jamie Foxx. He's going to babble and laugh. And Negroes ain't going to know the difference. They don't know art. These Negroes don't, so we're going to have him on stage just being like, I'm here to celebrate. And everything's going to be okay. Like, I don't even, even think we understand, like, how, 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 how awful that was. Killmonger, Killmonger was, was like genius and, and methodical in how he did his stuff. He wasn't no game. He wasn't no Crip Walker. He was there, but he wasn't that. And it, so I, I just, I, you know. Before we get to Al Sharpton, we have a lot of problems with making assessments and how we see things. I just want to throw that out there, too, since everybody's throwing accolades on Jamie Foxx. And everybody start acting. Oh, I'm not even going to get into how black celebrities still always want to act like they're 21 and 22 and 23. And you, I'm sure you, I'm, you, you got to be at least 55, Jamie Foxx, because I watched you when I was a kid and you was at Rock's house. So just, you're not a child anymore. And, like, stop acting like a child. Like, let's grow up. Let's. Everything. Everything comes in stages. Everybody needs to know their age. When I was, you know, the, and, and the Bible speaks to that too. When I was a child, I did childish things like, you grown, stop doing that stupid stuff and leave whatever you was on alone. So when I, when I talk about leaders, 
you know, but I, 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 we f tend to forget, like, the black community can be, the native black, descendant of slave community can be very um, kind of contradictory. We'll say we don't like snitches, but then we like Al Sharpton, and you know he has an FBI record of, like, snitching. And, you know, and if you're, if we said we don't like those kinds of informants, right? And so there's a lot of contradiction. So what I really want us to do is kind of streamline who we are and how we think and how we make assessments. And that's part of a solution. If you can't pick your leaders, ladies and gentlemen, if you cannot pick your leaders or if you're not okay with your leaders getting criticized, steel is supposed to start sharpen steel. But y'all don't let any steel hit your leaders. So then what happens is they soft, they marshmallow, puff leaders. Because you don't let any steel hit them. Why did you criticize him? That's what I'm supposed to do. And it's messed up that you didn't do that before me, but that's what I'm supposed to do. What you should be doing is you should tell the person I'm criticizing, you need to respond to what she just said. Because she said some real stuff. You need to respond. Defend yourself. That's what you do. You don't tell me not to criticize. You're a grown man. You're a grown woman. When you get in front of me, you have, need to have your stuff right. But see, we, we've never really had that in our community. We've never really had anybody to hold people accountable. So anybody can put a sharp shoot on, sharp suit on, perm their hair, and walk around and be cool. We be like, oh, he bought that business. He bought that business. No, 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 no. That's not how we judge people. So let me just say in terms of our hey, mistakes were made. Really big mistakes were made in terms of Reverend Al Sharpton. And there's no way that we can deal with what we need to deal with unless we deal with the fact that mistakes were made. Thank you, Mike B. Bezzy, I appreciate it. I just saw I, some things I see at the corner of my eye, some things I don't. So we have to deal with the fact that we made those mistakes. And we have to own that and we have to dissect that. Part of what I'm going to do is, before we go to break, is dissect that. And part of what I'm going to do is dissect how wrong Al Sharpton was about, I don't even know, like, why do I call him Reverend? What is the church? But part of him uh, is dissect why he was so wrong on immigration and why we believe stuff that's not true. Now, even with, see, let me just put up, let me see if I can find the clip. With Obama, see, part of the problem, see, this is something that Sharpton said very early on. And let me just put it up. Sharpton told us that having a black president is a challenge. Now, this is on 60 Minutes, if you want to see it. This clip that I'm reading from is, was on 60 Minutes. So if you want to see it, it's a 60 Minutes transcript. He was interviewed by, like, Leslie Stahl. You can check it out if you want to see it. But, he's, but Sharpton says if, 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 if he finds fault with Mr. Obama, he'd be abiding those who want to destroy him. So he said he has decided not to criticize the president about anything, even about black unemployment, which is twice the double rate. Understand something. This was Al Sharpton saying, like, I don't care what he do. The Negro black, and I ain't going to criticize him. He said, no matter what, I'm not going to criticize Obama. Understand why we should have called BS. I called BS way back then. I said, this is some BS. This is why we should have called it. Because you cannot represent the people and represent power at the same time. It is not possible. So what you told us in that quote, Al Sharpton, is that you were going to represent the president. By not representing us. You are telling us, I am going to represent power. I'm representing the White House. Because that's what the White House is. I don't care who in it. It don't matter who in the White House. The White House is power. The White House represent, this represents the militaristic power and the wealth power of the United States of America. That's what it is. You cannot represent the poorest people in America and represent the, 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 the power structure of America at the same time. You cannot do those two things simultaneously, but we let Al Sharpton do it. We should have told Al Sharpton, listen, you need to choose. If you're going to represent the president, you're going to do that. But you can't represent us at the same time. <laughs> you come through your life as this kind of street preacher activist. You cannot be this kind of activist and be on MSNBC and represent that and say you're going to represent me at the same time. That's not possible. And that's not helpful to me. Because let me tell you what the job of, if you want to know what the job of a black of a, of a black American DOS leader is in the 21st century, I will tell you. 
The job is to amplify our voices and amplify our concerns and amplify our needs in such a way that increase our leverage and our negotiating power and increase our likelihood to sit at the table with the people who wield power. That is your job. If you're going to represent us, that is your job. You have to amplify our voices and tell people what our needs are and then work to build leverage. And you can build alliances and community too to get our needs met. That is your job. Your job is not to speak for the White House. The White House, the Obama White House and every White House has always had a communications team. You don't need to represent them, but that's what you did. You saw Al Sharpton parrot the White House for years. That's what we saw happen. He just parroted the White House. And nobody thought anything of it. Nobody thought anything of this man behaving in that way. Now, see, there was a consequence to that, black people. Now, let me just put this up. I'm, well, let me put the, let me put the, um, the I think I'm going to put this up first. But there was a consequence to allowing, and this is the article um, that, I'm, that I'm pulling it from. This is a Jacobin article, How Obama Destroyed Black Wealth. This is the article. This is the article. How Obama destroyed. That's a Jacobin article, right? Now understand something. I want you to understand something. This is this is this is percent of home ownership. Now this is during the Obama years. You see the years go by. I want you to look at this chart closely and understand while this was happening to us. You have, you have Latinos who Al Sharpton is advocating for, or the migrants at the border, whether they be Mexican or El Salvadorian, Al Sharpton is down with you. Now, understand. Understand that we still, you see the little green line? The little green line is us. Understand that we still falling below everybody. We fall below, we, the little green, the little green line falls below even the black line, which is Latino. The yellow line is white people. White people don't broke away from everybody. They done broke away from everybody. Please understand that. Now I'm going to put up another chart for you. Same lines represent the same groups. Okay? Percent of homeowners with negative equity. Your house ain't worth nothing. Thank you, Mr. Mitch. Your house ain't worth nothing. Who do you think is at the top of that percentage of neg negative equity? Who do you think that is? Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the American Negro, the descendant of a slave. Now, you can come over here. You can come over here. You could just got here, and you can pass us. You can pass us if you're a European immigrant. You can, you can zoom right by. You can pass us if you're a Cuban immigrant. You can zoom right by. You can pass if you're Latino immigrant. You can zoom right by. We can be here for... 400 years, built the richest country in the world, everybody zooms past us. And you have somebody like Al Sharpton saying, no, 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 we're the same. Because, you know, as, at least we're the same with, 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 with some immigrants because we're brown. Brownness makes us the same. This is a problem. Black people, this is my native black descendants of slaves, my native black American descendants of slaves. This is a problem. This is what happened. See, what I want you to understand is this is what was happening during the period where Al Sharpton was saying, I'm not going to talk bad about the president. We were plummeting to the bottom at breakneck speed while he was saying, I'm not going to criticize him. See, what, you, what we have to understand is what we missed out on because he didn't criticize the president. What we should have been doing after we elected Obama was negotiating a better deal. We should have been looking at these numbers and saying, listen, Obama, wait, 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 wait. Black people came out in record numbers to push you over the top. We turned, we turned red states blue for you. We did that. We turned red states blue. So we should have been negotiating, okay, if you want us to come out again, what is that supposed to look like? Now, you have to. You have, to, you have to interrogate the data in order to understand that. 
and you have to come and say, listen, my people are messed up. You have to go back and you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to, you know, you're gonna have to prosecute some of these banks. You're gonna have to, you're gonna have to audit these banks and make sure they loan the black people. This stuff you can do without any kind of Republican support. This is what Al Sharpton should have been advocating when he was like, I'm hands off with the president. I'm the president's porch, 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 um, porch dog. I'm the, I'm the pit bull for the White House. That's who I am. That's not how anything should have went down. And so now you have us in this position. And let me just find this, this next chart. Because now you have us in an untenable, absolutely untenable position in terms of what we're facing because of who we supported. How, do we, how, do we, how are we supposed to get outside of that? I'm just asking a question. I just want to know the answer. Let me see if I see this. See this. I, I mean, I, I, I don't understand. Here we go. So Antonio Moore put this, put this up. Great piece of data. And it says, recent data shows that 90% of the small sliver of wealth held by black Americans is in the hands of our top few families. People have asked me for solutions. One is we must rise against the, the praise of black celebrity, boomers, you know, and, and boomer, he calls it boomer wealth hoarding and striverism and toxic ambition. We living on like a quarter of, look at that graph, like a quarter of a percent of wealth. How you running around here talking about what you're going to be and you living off a quarter of a percent? Look at them deciles. So, the, 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 so when you look at that, you see that 75? You see that 75.3? That them, Them's boomers and stuff. That, that's, that's not you. We're living off like a... Man, come on. What are we doing? And, and uh, gosh. I'm just looking at... As I talk to you, I'm looking at my messages. Supreme Court. Supreme Court again. Texas political map is largely not racial and gerrymander. This is... This is and we have no money. But y'all finna take back the block. Right? Ain't that what you finna do? You finna take back the block? Is that what you finna do? Looks very strange to me. I don't see what you're talking about. We don't have we don't have it. Bottom 80% of blacks. Bottom 80% of black families. 16 million of 20 many listen, 20 million families live off of one fourth a percent of wealth. What are you going to do with one-fourth a percent of wealth? What are you going to do with that? How are you going to make that work? And the thing that needed to happen, like it's almost as if, yes, we have to advocate now, but we had a shot with Obama. And we put this nincompoop in charge and let him be our surrogate. And instead of being our surrogate, he said, I'm not going, I'm not going to even criticize Obama. He was one of the ones who was basically saying that we were going to get hooked up in the second term. How many of y'all got hooked up the second term of Obama? I'm just going to, you can tell me in the chat. Who got hooked up? How many of y'all got hooked up when Obama got reelected? The hookup fall down because how many, and how many of you remember being told that? Some of y'all probably told us that. It means all that, like this number. See, let, let me put this back up really, really quickly because I need I need everybody to understand what this means. I want you to look at that chart and I want you to look at those red bars, right? And understand what that means. It means that all the family wealth is not us. Our working families are living on a quarter percent of wealth out of all family wealth. What are you going to do with that? What do you do? And so, and, and, and instead of, you know, and, and, and so and during that period, when Obama could have unilaterally, without Republican help, audited the banks, unilaterally, like, let me just, let me just bring a, let me just, I put up this, if you want to go read, if you want to go read the article, you can, this is the article that it came from, but I just want to read, I just want to read, like, something really quickly, not, you know, because I'm, I'm so upset. I get so upset when people when people say, "Well, we, you know, what could he? What, what, what? You know, he couldn't have done nothing. He, he, he. What, what? I don't. I don't understand what your, what your, 
what your um, what your problem was. Former Wells Fargo employees later testified that the that the black that the bank deliberately tricked middle class black families into subprime what they call ghetto loans. Overall, a Center for Responsible Lending study found that from 2004 to 2008. 6.2 percent of white borrowers with a credit score of 60, 66 and up got subprime mortgages, while 19.3 percent of such Latino borrowers and 21.4 percent of black borrowers did. Okay, understand that Obama ran his Justice Department. They could have prosecuted these people. Understand that this is not something that Republicans stop making from doing. This is not anything that this is not anything that he was prevented from doing. You got to stop saying that and you got to stop believing it. He says and it here's another part. For homeowners, and let me put up this piece about uh, let me see if I have this piece about homeowner. Well, I just put it up. But let's just put this up too just for the sake of like understanding. Look at that upside down. Look who look at the look at the look at the death house. Well, let me just put this up. But for homeowners, the largest source of potential relief was, ironically, that same bank bailout, which contained an unspecified appropriation to prevent avoidable foreclosures. The Obama administration designed and implemented the foreclosure relief effort, calling it the Home Affordable, the home affordable Mortgage Program, HAMP, and set aside $75 billion for the effort. You could have bailed all of us out. You could have bailed us out. But HAMP proved to be an abject failure. The, the basic problem was that the government paid mortgage service servicers who processed the payments and paperwork for the mortgage owner to conduct mortgage modification. Services have an incentive to keep people paying on a high principle since they receive a percentage of the outstanding debt. They, ha they even have an incentive to foreclose because they are paid from the proceeds of a foreclosure sale. So you understand that, that Obama, in terms of being president, understand that in terms of being a leader, in terms of being president of the most the wealthiest country in the world, you set the incentives. You could have incentivized this in such a way that benefited native black descendants of slaves. You did not do that. And that was totally within your power. Lacks oversight from the Treasury Department, the Department of Justice made things worse. Worse, Some servicers tricked people into foreclosure, according to several investigations and sworn testimony by the Bank of America whistleblowers. And by repeatedly losing people's paperwork or engaging in other tricks, the servicers squeezed out a final few payments fees before foreclosing. So they got a bunch of money out of you and then still put down the hammer. Still put down the hammer. So I want to know from you. If your kids have no college fund. How do you think they're going to college? And if your kids have no college fund. How long do you think. Your 30 year old is going to live with you. They're not leaving. And what Al Sharpton is saying. Is that instead of being concerned about the fact that they're not leaving, instead of being concerned about the fact that they got to drive Uber, he wants to bring more migrant workers in here for your kids to compete with. Because understand that Al Sharpton came about during a different time. He's a boomer. So you live, understand that Al Sharpton lives in an apartment building with a Trader Joe's on the bottom. He goes and sips cognac with people on Wall Street, an exclusive Wall Street bar, but he wants your kids to compete with migrant, desperate migrant workers who are coming from desperation and poverty. He wants your kids to compete with that. His kids are fine. Now, they fine, they fine in most ways, but, you know, th they got some other stuff going on, but we're not going to really talk about that. Well, we can. Um, you, know, you know, they got some other stuff going on in terms of them fighting and fighting and cursing and carrying on something awful. Right? They got a lot of stuff going on, his kids, and it kind of makes me wonder. I can understand if you don't have kids or you don't have a family, but if you have access to all this, this affluence and you, and you were doing all this stuff, how can you, you have a family structure, you had, you had a wife, and now you got a little hot little thing or whatever. How could you not make your own family structure, structure work? You had one. And you had the means, unlike most of us, you had the means for a family and couldn't build one, couldn't build functional kids and, could, and couldn't maintain a marriage and you want to leave me. You're obviously not in a position to do that. It's time for you to abdicate that responsibility and abdicate that throne and give it to somebody else who has the ability and the means and the intellectual capacity and everything and the integrity to do that, Mr. FBI informant. Please. 
Understand that Al Sharpton's kids don't have to compete with the kids who come here because it's never the kids who so understand it's never the kids. See, this is part of the problem. It's never, ever, 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 ever their kids who have to compete with people who come from desperation. You have people who will create this desperation, but they don't have to compete with it. Okay. Well, what do you mean, Yvette? I'm talking about your girl. I'm talking about your girl, Hillary Clinton. Well, what are you talking about Hillary for? Well, well, here's the thing. If people were really concerned about the immigrants and the migrants who show up on our borders, I've heard a lot about I've heard a lot about the, the, the Hondurans who show up on the border and how poor Honduras is, but nobody wants to talk about how Hillary Clinton helped destabilize that, that country. If you were really serious about helping the migrants at the border, you would say, what can we do in terms of our foreign policy? If you were really serious, this would be a foreign policy discussion. That's how I know you're not serious. Do y'all want to know why we've been seeing this on the TV 24-7 for the last week and a half, two weeks? It's not because people have hearts. Ain't nobody got no heart. This is America. That ain't what it is. We've been seeing it because Republicans and Democrats agree. So Democrats want more brown people to be voters in their party. So they want to get in Africa. They want more brown people. Republicans want more cheap labor. They want everything from cheap labor at the factory to, 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 to cheap nannies. So you have both the elite groups of both parties agreeing that we want more migrant workers. None of these people are thinking about how that affects any American child, especially a native black American child. Nobody cares about what happens to us. No. And we don't have anybody in a position to make people care about what happens to us. So what do you mean, Yvette? We don't have anybody in a position to make people care about what happens to us. Well, let me show you something. More than half of the top U.S. tech companies were founded by immigrants or the children of immigrants. Read that one more time for yourself and your own edification, ladies and gentlemen. More than half of the top U.S. tech companies were founded by immigrants or the children of immigrants. Okay. That's big, right? Okay, look at what it look at look at some of the names on this list. And I'm just gonna make it bigger and then make it smaller. But let's just let's just look at a little bit of this. Close up. Cause I don't want to Steve Jobs, the son of a Syrian immigrant. Jeff Bezos is the son of a Cuban immigrant. Google founder Ser Ser Sergey Sergey Brin was born in Russia. And Facebook co-founder Eduardo Saverin, Brazilian. Okay? Now, understand something. Understand, when you read this, understand what it means. You have to understand what it means. It means everybody else gets to come to this country. Steve Jobs was one half Syrian, right? And he got to be white. Everybody else gets to come to this country and be white. And white in this country is not a color. White in this country means you get to come to this country and just be normal. You get to come here and be normal. We don't ever get to be normal. And then somebody says, these immigrants, Al Sharpton says, they're just like us. He said that their, their lives, their struggle is nearly identical. Our struggle as native black DOS is nearly identical to that of the migrants who show up at the border. Let me just tell you something. The struggle of migrants who show up at the border ain't even identical. The struggle of a, uh, of a, of a, of a person from... from um, from Ecuador or a person from Honduras or Mexico or the Congo or none of them things like in the Congo they got they got they got people chopping they had uh, a, a civil war and Honduras is, is gangs and all kinds of stuff and other countries just abject poverty the, 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 the migrants who show up at our border don't even have exact stories so how are they gonna have an ex exact story to us and how are you gonna put us it's so disrespectful to put the, to put people in this country Black American, descendants of slaves, on the same level with people who are at the border coming from another country. We're citizens in this country. Do not put me in the same category as someone who is trying to come here illegally. We have parents who died in this country. We have, we have grandparents who died in this country. Do not say that my struggle is the same. And even when you go beyond citizenship, how is chattel slavery where where African slaves were brought here. And people say, well, but they were African. No, you cannot ring that bell when you don't have access to your body. And we have, so that's how, 
European blood and all that. You can't unring that bell. But how do you how do you bring how do you compare a group that was brought here forcibly, sold into chattel slavery, built this country with free labor, and has had the boot of the government on its neck since we got here to a group that's maybe escaping gang gang violence in Honduras or whatever. And they just they voluntarily running here. How do you say, well, they're nearly exactly the same? How do you say that with a straight face? What does that mean? And what you also have to understand is the fact that these people, these these children, these immigrants and their children went on to become, you know, tech leaders. What that means is that they have somebody. What it means is that immigrants. Immigrants, these immigrants who aren't even citizens, what it means is that they have somebody. They have somebody to advocate for them at the top of the totem pole. So you're not even a citizen in this country, and you have somebody to advocate for you on that level. You have somebody to advocate for you. See, that's what would have happened for us if, the, if we had not been locked out. And we got locked out with everything. Remember, we had black businesses and, they, and, and white mobs used lynching. It wasn't just black Wall Street. It was everywhere. Read the book 1919. There was a great Los Angeles Times article about how lynchings and mob violence was used to kill black business. Understand that killed us in terms of us creating our own Jeff Bezos. Because we had, we always, people like, well, black people need to, black people need to, do, 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 do for self. We did do for self. And the government allowed these people to burn it down. And now after it's burnt down, you want me to compete with the children of these desperate immigrants. Bezos is Cuban, but he's seen as white. Everybody else gets to come everywhere and be seen as white. We we born and raised here. We don't even we never get to come outside of what it, what it means to be native black Americans in the flag. We never get to come outside of that. Everybody else gets to shake that off. Remember this? More Hispanics are dis declaring themselves white. So how does, how does Al Sharpton get to say, well, we're the same, when these people get to come here and then after a generation or so, they get to be white? How is that the same as me? You know, you, you had Pelosi on Trump's separation of migrant kids. Come near our cubs and you got a problem. No one talks about black people this way. No one says, come, come, come for our black people and you got a problem. Nobody talks about us this way. Not even our own people talk about us this way. You see Google and Facebook and the leaders of all those companies who come from immigrants, who have parents who are immigrant, who immigrated here. You see them standing up for us. But you don't see anybody, even our own people. Al Listen, black people built Al Sharpton from the bottom up. And he's still, he's not even for his own people this way. And you let him talk and you say, well, you know what? He got a point. And you don't realize he don't have a point. Nothing that he says makes any sense. Nothing. They get to come here and become white. We could be here 400 years and we don't become white, which is normal. Stop thinking of white as a color. They just get to be normal and we have to stay abnormal. And nobody cares. Nobody cares what happens to us. And y'all still letting him talk. Said we have, he said we have shared experiences may, that may manifest itself differently. They are us and we are them. Go watch his Politics Nation from Sunday. Go watch it. And then you have the people in tech. All these immigrants from tech, when you say they are us, they don't look like us because when you look at tech right now, especially Silicon Valley, they ain't hiring a uh, 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 black American DOS. So how are they us? It seems to me that this whole solidarity thing just goes one way. I'm supposed to help you get at the border, but two, two generations later when you become a tech billionaire, you don't think about me and you don't care about me. So, well, then you're going to have to be wherever you be. I can't be competing with that. It's just not good. It's not, it's, it's not a positive thing for me and my people. It just is what it is. Don't feel no kind of way. Don't get your feelings hurt. See, what you have to understand, and, and I'm going to say this and then I'm, I'm going to go to the phones, but understand one thing for me, black people. If you don't understand anything else in this life, please understand this. Please understand this. 
There is no reparations. If your belief is that we're just all equal. If equality and sameness. If equality and sameness are what you are striving for. There will be no reparations. There will never be any kind of redress. Because you're saying that we are the same as people who just crossed the border. Well, if we're the same, then there is nothing, there's nothing special about us. There is no specific justice claim. There is no specific contribution. We're all just equal. I'm not interested in equality. Because we've said before how, how slaves were more valuable than the railroads and the wealth and all this other stuff. So there is no sameness. There is no equation in terms of what that migrant who just crossed the border is contributing and what my people contributed. There is no comparison. There is none. Understand that you have people right now. There's a lawsuit in Chicago going on right now where you have a, a specifically black men who, 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 who are saying... Especially that they they go to construction sites and stuff, and and the, and the managers won't uh won't want people who speak Spanish, because they speak Spanish. There's a you know there's a there are discrimination lawsuits about that. Stop it with all this solidarity stuff. There is no solidarity. There is no brown coalition. The only brown coalition exists to put Democrats in office, and that's why that's what they're fighting for. You think these Democrats all of a sudden developed a heart? You know, the, the, the specialness that white people have is built into the hole that they have on wealth. Where is our specialness? Everybody who crossed the border, we say they're just like us. How? And how does it benefit me to say I'm just like somebody who just got here? What are we bonded on? I just want you to tell me. Are we bonded on ideology? No, 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 no. We're not bonded. Are we bonded on nationality? No, I'm American and you Honduran and Mexican. No, 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 no. Are we bonded on language? No, not bonded on language. Are we bonded on some kind of relationship? No, we ain't got no relationship. No, 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 no. Well, how am I bonded? How am I like these people? And then don't tell me, well, Yvette, there are black immigrants too. Please tell me how I have anything in common with a Kenyan. That any more, any, anything more in common with a Kenyan than I have with an El Salvadoran. Well, I, I don't got nothing in common with none of them. I'm just American as everybody else. Stop trying to make me not American. See, what you're trying to do is make me into a foreigner and say, I'm just like these foreigners who got here. Just got here. You lie. Just because America has treated me wrong doesn't mean I'm not American. I'm as American as apple pie. American has mistreated me. America has mistreated me and my people continually. That don't make me not American. I'm just as American as anybody else. More so than a bunch of these people who just got here a generation or two generations ago. And you're going to try to tell me I'm just like the immigrants. Which you're trying to extricate me from what it means to be American. And put me in a pot of immigrants. No. And we should have been saying that. No, I'm not no, I'm not no immigrant who just got here. And stop trying to make me like one. We don't got nothing in common. We got parents who we got we got parents and grandparents who died in this country, who built this country and still died in abject poverty. Our line goes all the way back. And the minute somebody brown comes to this country, you want to say I'm just like the other person because we brown. And then that person gets up and they don't do nothing for me. Yeah, we brown, but you get to Silicon Valley and you don't do nothing for me. But you want to tell me or you a day laborer and you want to tell me, yeah, yeah, yeah. Remember that hidden video? What a dude said, we're not hiring no black people. Sorry, man. That's what a that's what a that's what a Mexican migrant told who was working at a construction site told a black person. But you want to tell me our struggles are just alike. Y'all ought to make man, come on. Give me a break. This is so transparent. And forget just forget just calling Al Sharpton out. I don't understand why you watch his TV shows. I don't understand why you listen to his radio show. He ain't never even had, he ain't even entertaining to watch. He ain't never had a good relationship with the teleprompter. He just babbles his way through everything and y'all show up for it. He don't even understand what it means to be him. Like, he don't even understand what it means to be a grown person. All these people who are grown, you too old to be running around talking about how you got to 60 and just finally decided and figured out how to lose weight and taking selfies. Grow up. I ain't nearly as old as you, but they don't see me walking around doing that kind of stuff. Why, Yvette? Why don't you do it? Because I'm grown. That's what it means to be an adult. Then the next thing you're going to have, people going to be telling us, like, we should learn Spanish. You know, we have to learn, like, 
we have to learn like a third world language in our home country to be able to do something. And then if you tell us we got to learn Spanish, then like we're at a disadvantage. You have places right now that require you to be bilingual. I'm not at an advantage if I'm, I, 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 but, but, but we want to get mad when Republicans say this. They wrong about most stuff. A lot of racism going on over there, but they ain't wrong about like that the citizenship should matter. They're not wrong about citizenship should make you priority. You want to just make me into whatever immigrant decides they want to come across the I got to be that person. Mexicans, they can't speak English, but they going to get some kind of, they going to, at a lot of these schools, they get a little, little Spanish teacher. And we driving Uber and still on the bottom. What did the Texaco exec say that time when, when there was that lawsuit? They like the black jelly beans. The black jelly beans just stay stuck in the bottom. Nobody want them. No, man. No. No. When you have an open borders philosophy, please understand this, black people. When you believe in open borders, what you're basically saying is that we do not have a country. Because if you don't have, you can't have a country with no borders. If you don't have any borders, you don't have a country. And so you're saying that we shouldn't have a country. When we need this country that we're in to do some kind of redress, it can show up in many ways, but we need our country to do some kind of redress for what happened to us. But you're saying that we really shouldn't have a country. Open the borders up, let everybody, and then it's your kid that has to compete with these people. But you'll go and berate your son or daughter, why don't you got a job? I can't believe you're living like this. Yeah, because you opened all the borders up and you told them to compete with everybody from everywhere. No matter how desperate, no matter how illegal, whatever, just compete. Get out there and compete. What do you expect? You don't know how to show up for your own people. You cannot not know how to show up for your own people. And then expect anybody else to show up for you. Y'all have been elevating Al Sharpton all this time, and he doesn't know how to show up consistently for his own people. Out there doing for everybody because he's trying to make the party happy. He don't know. He's just spinning. We got so many black people out here just spinning like a little wheel. Well, he got everything. He's that boomer, right? He's that, he's that boomer. And he got everything. And he, he's cool. You can't talk about what America owes you at the same time devaluing American citizenship. American citizenship and the debt that we're owed are very important. And most right now, we should just be talking about like guest workers. While we retrain workers, American workers, to do the job they used to not do anymore, we have to get those people paid and retrain them. And in the interim, while we're training them, we can have some guest workers here to do some stuff that needs to be done. But guest workers means that you can go home. Because you, you understand that most of the people who are in these countries are left in these countries. They're not coming here. So you're not really helping. You say, oh, I'm just helping a bunch of people by letting all these people come in the border. No, because the majority of the people are left in their home countries. So what are you doing in terms of foreign policy to help the home countries? That's what we need to talk about. If you really want to help these people, that's how I know you don't. And, and, and understand something. When you look at why, you know, one of the things that we, I have to ask myself, that how did we get here? Like one of the questions you should always ask is how do we get here? Like, how do we get to a point where, where and I, because I used to be here too. I say that all the time because I think, I think black people should start being comfortable changing their minds. And one of the reasons we don't change our minds is because we feel like we've always been in this space. This is the intellectual space that we've always been in. I used to advocate hard for immigrants. Did all kind of stuff. But I had to really sit back and kind of interrogate that. And, and what I realized is that so much of what we hear on the news and coming is from it's filtered through black immigrants who are in that space. And I mean, your girl Joy Reid, you know, who has like a parent one one of her parents was like a geologist, and one of them was a professor. Now you come from slaves. One of them was from Guyana, and one was from I think the Congo. Now you come from you come from slaves who have had the boot on our neck since we got here. How you gonna compete with somebody who looked just like you who got that background? And then she gets on TV and she's like, yeah, sister girl, and all this stuff. And you think she's regular, but she ain't. So part of the reason that we have had people who have an immigrant experience that is not a DOS experience, and we don't know that. So we don't know until they start advocating, and we realize that level of advocacy is immigrant because that's their life. Their life is not our life. 
The lineage. Lineage is everything. The lineage is not our lineage. Forget being brown or having kinky hair, which, you know, even which Indians don't even have, right? But forget any of that. Lineage is everything. Same thing with um the article that came out today. Your boy, your boy Warren William been dogging black people, DOS people on Fox News forever. Your parents are like, you got like Panamanian parents or something. What are we talking about? Like, why do you even get to speak about us? Like, it should be to the point to where you don't get to talk about us. You don't get to say nothing about us. You don't come from here. You can do, you can do your thing, but you don't get to come here and cast a judgment and talk about what we should do. This is about lineage, class, struggle, character. This is not about a Panamanian who wants to come here and tell me what you think black people should do or what you think black people should act like or what you think what you think the problems are with black life. You don't get to be here and not have that lineage and think you're going to have that conversation. This is a problem. Al Sharpton is a problem. He's not a net benefit for our community. I don't know why we don't know that. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to um, go to the go to the calls real quick because um, I want you to be able to come back and uh, everybody have their say. So, remember, try to, I'm gonna try to take as many calls as I can as usual. Try to keep it concise um, so that we can so that we can go through it. All right, back in about three minutes.
going on, Breaking Brown family? We are about to go to the calls. Um, I want to hear what everybody got to say. So the first call I'm coming to is 732. 732, I'm coming to you. What's your name? Where you calling from? What's on your mind? Going on. Yvette, if we have no, Yvette, if we have no borders, we have no country. Sound mighty, mighty close to your boy Trump. Mighty close to your boy Trump. With that, I'm just playing. This is, this is, this is Caesar the Surf. Since everybody got a name, we got Charlemagne the God, and everybody else. I'm going by Caesar the Surf. This is a Caesar the Surf calling from Jersey. How you doing tonight, Yvette? I'm all right. How about you? Good, good. You know, I was thinking about your point and and. and thinking about some of your previous videos and I remember a couple months back you had that video where you had the gentleman on stage and he showed how if we try to you know I guess be the the receiving basket for every disturbed group across the world and he had all those bubble gums all the bubble uh, yeah bubble yeah gums yeah gums I remember that that, that he was pouring in that container and I just think that's that was a great analogy maybe something you know, I'd love if you could post a link to that video because I've been trying to find that um, and share that with some people in my group in terms of, you know, we're trying to be on the receiving end of everybody and every group. It just doesn't make sense, first of all, just in terms from, you know, logistical and resource standpoint. But, um, you know, when you were also talking about tonight, you said how this, some immigrants have this mentality that just because we were mistreated, that that also entails that, you know, we're we're on the same level as them. And I definitely run into that same attitude of, you know, with certain immigrants that I run into and have these debates or discussions with of, you know, what makes you think you're better than us? What makes you think you're more entitled than us? And I mean, you heard that with your girl, uh, Purple Lipstick, when you were showing the thing uh, with, with, with the uh, the Oh, yeah, she really, she, she really thought she really thought she was special. She really thought she was special. Oh, she like thought she was so special. Your country? Your country? Well, see, understand, understand, but understand, understand what she said, Carla. She said America's not your country; it's a transient country, and that's what they're really trying to turn America right. into. This country right. where everybody gets to come right. and take what they want and leave, and and they leave us with nothing. Yeah. Like it's almost they're trying to turn this into yeah. a country where everybody gets to come and just take everything and leave us with the husk. Yes. Yeah. That's it, Yvette. All right. Show. Love what you're doing. Um, enjoying tonight's episode. Thank Appreciate you. you. Appreciate you. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, that's what's happening. Like, you, you have to understand the problem is not, like, we have this, I think, I think as, 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 you know, uh, Native Black American descendants of slaves, we have this problem where we like to see America as, like, because America has so mistreated us, we kind of think of America as, like, sometimes we act like we'd be happy if it was gone. You don't want to be homeless. Like the problem isn't the problem isn't that America exists. The problem is how America wields power, both do, both domestically and internationally. That's what we have to tackle. We have to tackle how the, the how America wields power and destabilizes all these countries, and how America wields power internally and 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 robs us of any of any wealth and 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 any redress for what happened to us. The problem isn't that America is here. The problem is what we're allowed to do and have here and how America reaps and, 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 and all those adventures abroad and the imperialism abroad, that's what has to be tackled. You're not going to fix that by letting in more immigrants. Like you fix that by fixing the contribution that America makes to destabilizing these countries. That's how you fix it. But nobody wants to talk about that. And that's how I know people aren't serious. When you don't want to talk about Hillary Clinton and Honduras, then I know you're not serious about like what you really say you're trying to do, because that's what you do. You have to talk about that. There's no there's no way around having that conversation and dealing with that for some people very uncomfortable truth. Um. Anyway, I'm going to um, I'm going to uh three three four right now three three four. What's your name and where you calling from? Hey, this is Keith from uh, Montgomery, Alabama. What's going on? Um, pretty good, pretty good. Um, I've, I've been listening a well, lot. I just got in um, recently, listened to the show. And um, I, I like what you said about lineage being important. important. And you also spoke about how um, they have people in um, Washington to like speak and advocate on their behalf. 
And I was like, wow, that is a, like a really powerful leverage that we don't have. And I was like, what, is it is it even possible for us to like infiltrate and advocate for ourselves in, in, in that light? Did that make sense? I mean, it, it's possible. It's possible, but like, let me just say this. The thing that keeps me up at night is it's possible, but it needs to happen really fast because because income inequality is happening so fast. Like we have to get on the same page really fast and put people in place really fast and get rid of people really fast. And what I'm seeing is that too many of us, not the Breaking Brown family, the Breaking Brown family is on board and they understand. But we got Breaking Brown family ain't all of Black America, Black American DOS. So what happens is we got too many people who are not nimble and don't want to learn and don't want to understand. And like we don't need all of them, but we need a critical mass. And we can't reach that critical mass with these slew-footed Negroes who just can't get on board. Like, we need them. We need enough of them. We don't need all of them. We don't even need a majority. We just need a critical mass. We need enough of them to understand that we have to advocate for ourselves and build new leaders and put new leaders in place who, not saying that they won't ever form a coalition. You have to form coalitions. That's part of politics. But your main priority has to be your community. We have to do that fast because everybody else is doing it and everybody else has been doing it for a long time. Okay, only have two more points. Two more points. Um, one is about um, how you brought up, I really like you brought up the foreign policy thing. Uh-huh. That is like a really big deal, and nobody want to talk about that. That is like the huge thing I, I, I heard from tonight. And, oh, and you mentioned that Al Sharpton trying to like, um, trying to say our struggle is their struggle. We are totally two different groups of people. Our struggle is not the same. Yeah, but but we don't tell him that. You know, we we can't we can't reach critical mass if everybody wants to exploit black people and sell REITs and talk about how we're gonna rebuild Wall Street and be rich and and just you know if one if we're gonna let one be the voice of the sentence of slaves and he's pan, he probably knows more about Panamanian history than he than he does about 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 us. I mean, thank you, Clementine Dixon. I appreciate the donation, but like, there's no way there's no way to do that. There's no way to do that if we don't if we're not gonna if we don't have standards if we uh, it, it's not possible. You're so, right. You're right. so what's your last point for me, Carlos? Oh, that, that, that was it. Okay, okay, I appreciate I appreciate you. Thank you, thank you, Carlos. But yeah, I think I think I think listen, we don't we don't really be operating right. Like we don't really. You know, we let Juan and Joy Reid and everybody just like talk for us. How do you how do you get to do that? Because one of the problems too is that people like Al have been advocating from a place of individual injustice as opposed to systemic injustice. What do you mean, Yvette? I mean that like if you all remember what Al Sharpton used to do every time there was some kind of police killing or mistreatment of black person or whatever, or or or, 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 or it, it was he would run out and advocate. What we really need is like we need to have this lineage conversation and we really need to advocate for ourselves based on systemic oppression that is unlike any kind of oppression for any other group. That doesn't mean anybody else hasn't been discriminated against, but that's not the same thing as 400 years of systemic oppression that has resulted in us being locked out. Where everybody else is come on here and be white and rise up. We get stuck to the bottom of no fault of our own. That's what it means. So you don't even really know how to do that on that level. You never really got to that level, so what, what? What? There's, there's no. I don't have any. I don't have any use for you. Like I don't have any use for you. How could I? So, that's what has to happen. So I'm going to um three four seven now three four seven. What's your name? Where you calling from? What's on your mind? Hey Ben, how you doing, sis? This is uh, I'm doing all right. Ray from New York, A.K.A. Mr. Blood Equity. Ah, yeah, that was a good, that was a good line. That was a good line. They may have sweat equity, but they don't have blood equity. I got another line for you today, sister. Okay. Ready? I'm ready. Here we go. The new terminology to add to the black American lexicon is involuntary race traders. Involuntary. Now they're involuntary or they're just race traders? Involuntary race traders? Well, I'm explaining to you. Just okay. Like involuntary manslaughter for getting out of fighting. That's true. Okay. Explain it to you. Okay. What is an involuntary race 
trader. Uh-huh. It is one who may be sincere about their concerns and interests for the community and love their people. But due to them reaching the limitations of their imagination, their intelligence, and their cognitive abilities, usually begin to run against the wall. Uh. And that is the wall of ideas to move your people forward. They then start to espouse positions which are antithetical to our interests. And because they run against the other thing, Mm. which is ego and self-interest, they then become pawns and tools from other people who have not reached their cognitive and intellectual limitations and figure them out and begin to use them. Even though they don't know they are being used, Mm. they think they are being sincere. Mm. Now, the reason why they're able to do this is because there is no retributive consequence for selling out black people. No, no, no. That has to that has to change. There has to be a price for espousing these ideas, these positions, these politics that have, that are not good for. Well, I think I think you just excommunicate these people. Why can't we excommunicate them? Like Al Sharpton shouldn't be able to walk into a beauty salon or barbershop. He shouldn't even like if he walks around us. We should just be like, no, bro. You know we don't mess with you. No, we everybody done with you. We threw you away last year. Like, why can't we? That that much we can do. Because that doesn't get enough press. But he feel it. See, the thing is that I I, I, no no no. But he feels it, though. I need you, like, even if it doesn't get pressed, I need us to do it in a way that they feel it. Like, it might not get pressed because right. we don't we don't own press. We don't have no more black media. Right. They will, they will only feel it when the people who empower them and put them on TV begin to realize they are not effective pawns. Oh. Uh, Meaning. That's true. Good I will, point. I will stop you. Okay, let's, let's, listen, I'm from New York, okay? Uh-huh. I know Al's history well. Okay. Okay. I know when he got that job at CNBC. He got that job at CNBC when after, I think it was Prop, Prop, Proposition 8 in California for um, voting in homosexuality. Uh-huh. When, when the political left and the gay agenda people realized So, so you saying, you saying, I don't really think that's a gay agenda, but you're saying, you're saying that Al's rise to fame came in line with the LGBT community as opposed to his advocacy for black people? No, what I'm saying is that once they realized that it was going to be black folks who were going to stand in the way because of our moral conservatism, they got Al. What are we going to do? They went and got Al. And what they did was they went out shopping, they went out shopping for people they could put on TV. And if you remember the opening monologue for his television show, it said what? Gay, bisexuals, immigrants, blacks, women, they all must be protected. Oh, I don't even remember that. That was his, that was his opening monologue to mm. the show. Mm. And so he, unbeknownst to him, like I said, these people reach their cognitive of, of limitations. Mm. They don't know the game. And so they're easy to get pimped. They're easy to be used. And they put him on that show, and he became the talking piece that allowed the political left to use, like I said before, black energy to then sneak in their agenda. Black energy to sneak in their agenda. And you said they went shopping for a Negro. They went Negro shopping. Is that what you said? Yes. Yes. And they said, what? Some Negro we can find who is sincere, but is not wise enough to understand the master game. Okay. Who can we pay, put on TV, and get him to espouse these points of view so we can get in here and well, I do make think, all these changes we want? 
I do, I do, I do agree that they go shopping. I do agree that they go shopping. Um, and they go shopping very cheap. Remember, Byron Allen said he but he got paid off by a two-piece chicken dinner. But you know, I don't think Al eat chicken no more. I think dude, that little picture, he don't eat chicken no more. But I, I agree with you, Carla, on that. On that, I got, I'm gonna let you go because I got the lines are full. I want to thank you though. I, 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 I agree though. I think, I, I think involuntary race traders. Involuntary race Thank you, brother. I think they do go shopping. I think they do go shopping. And I think they do use black energy and black people because of our history in this country. Native black descendants of slaves because of our history in this country to validate whatever they have. Whether you agree or disagree is not the issue. Like to, to validate whatever they, whatever the issue is that they're using. And Al is just, you know, we have a lot of useful pawns. That doesn't mean that, that, that white supremacy isn't at the top. But at some point, the, the question becomes when do we hold the puppets accountable as well? Like we just, you know, it's, it's easy just to be like, well, shake your fist at white supremacy without holding the puppets accountable. Um, and, you know, it, it's interesting when you think about it. We saw Obama. Understand Obama, a Kenyan father, um, white mother. We saw Ta-Nehisi Coates. Ta-Nehisi Coates and, and, you know, a native black American, D.O.S., interview Obama and we saw Obama tell Colts that he didn't agree with reparations after inheriting like $400,000 in white wealth. So you get to sit here off the backs of native black DOS people, native black American DOS people. You get to have this office off of how we cloaked you in blackness and cloaked you in Americanness, right? We, we made your Hussein go away. We made your foreignness go away. So you get to sit here at this table and say to ta Coach, you don't believe in reparations while you eat off the 400000 or whatever that your white granny left you. That's what we allowed to happen. We did that. We allowed that to happen. We made those mistakes. We looked at him and saw one of us. And it never was that way. And that's something that only we can fix. So I'm going to um, area code 870-870. What's your name? Where you calling from? What's on your mind? How you doing, Javette? I'm doing pretty good. How about you? Uh, Piers Black, a.k.a. You know, pro-black Uncle Tom. <laughs> pro-black Uncle Tom. Coming that's something. You again. <laughs> nah, but, um, but... Like, what you're talking about today is why it's kind of like the meaning of that name, you know, because you mostly hear, like, Republicans and conservatives talk about these type of issues, and people will label you Uncle Tom, but they don't realize, like, I'm so for my people yeah. that you're calling me Uncle Tom, and that's why I say the pro-black Uncle Tom or whatever, and, like, you know, just like the issues you're saying today or whatever, you know, like, people could... You know, like, you'll be labeled, you know, well, I'll label you like a pro-black Uncle Tom because you're so for our people that people don't get, like, it's like, you know what I'm saying, because it's not the normal liberal democratic, you know, talking point or whatever. So, like, they'll label you, you know what I'm saying, Uncle Tom, like, you're so, like, 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 like you against the black community, but you're so for the black community that they don't even get it because, yeah. you know, that's not the normal thing that you would hear uh, Reverend Barber talk about or Roland Martin, you know, or Angela Rod, things like that. And, like, that's why I say that name, you know, like, it's not saying that Uncle Tom, as in, like, you are Uncle Tom, but it's like people just don't, you know, get it or whatnot. And um, I just want to thank you. Thank you. For everything you're doing. I appreciate it. Yeah, just keep doing what you're doing. You know, like people, you know, keep educating us, you know, the way you break things down for people, you know, because you're really, you know, giving us something to stand on because the things out here, like uh, people don't un people don't look at the end result of this fight that we have, you know. People don't, it's like, you know, like we'll we'll fight for certain things, and and it's like like do 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 these people do? Well, I'm gonna say we do. We really, you know, think about the things that you know what I'm saying like we're fighting against or whatnot because the end result is going to be bad if it actually goes through or whatnot. Like, yeah. well, how how are we going to benefit from it or whatnot? And um, 
even though me and you, you know, we'll bump heads at times, mostly just about uh, how the financial things uh, aspect work. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the other uh, points, you know, we, I agree with you a thousand percent, you know, and I just appreciate everything you're doing. Thank you. And keep it up. You Thank know, you. I appreciate you, that. You know, all right. I appreciate that, Carla. No, I think, I think, I think that's, a, I think that's just, I think that's just conditioning. You know, Uncle Tom is the title character of Harriet Beecher Stowe's 1852 novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin. The term Uncle Tom is also used as a derogatory epithet for an exceedingly subservient person, particularly when that person is aware of their own lower class status based on race. We've been kind of messing that word up for a minute. Um, or the phrase or whatever. Um, but, but, you know, it's, it is what it is. It is what it is. Like we have been conditioned to, to view people a certain way and adopt certain vernaculars. And if you hear a black person say this, they must be pro Trump and they must love Trump. If you hear a black person question in any way, you know, what's happening at the border or any way say, well, let's, let's, let's deal with our immigration situation. Maybe we need to bring down the levels back to pre 1980. Like, if you hear that in any way, you're automatically lambasted as somehow pro-Republican, right-wing, frothing at the mouth, whatever. And it's just, it's just not true. Um, so, I'm going to the next call. I'm going to 404. What's your name? Where you calling from? What's on your mind? Hi, Meg. Good evening. This is Good evening. from Atlanta. What's going on? Hey. Um, I just wanted to share a story. You were talking about how so many immigrants come to America and they become white, and they be, 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 they're able to take up, you know, take part in the American dream. And so I work with mostly millennials. I've called in several times before. And on Thursday, this happened last week, Thursday, I didn't realize a young black girl came in my office. There's only two black people that work there, and okay. she was the third. So I was like, oh, hey. And what was interesting, she came in with one of my other coworkers, and they're all in their 20s. And okay. he's German. He's a German immigrant. Uh, he's probably like second generation. Okay. So Friday we came. I Friday I came into work, and I was like, "Well, where is she?" And the director sales was like, "Oh, she quit." Now on Thursday, I was like, "Hold on, that's weird. Why did she quit? What happened?" So one of the white guys that sat by her was like, "She was complaining about." Um, the cost of parking. So I work downtown in Atlanta, and it's twenty two dollars a day to park. Good God! And so, yes, twenty two dollars. Twenty two dollars. There's no monthly parking left, so you have to pay twenty two dollars. And she was complaining uh, about parking, and she she also said a debt collector called, and he overheard her talking to a debt collector. And so when you talk about what it means to be black in America, I literally realized. And I wish, of course, I just met her, that I was able to talk to her. They were like, oh, she was really upset about how much it cost. And mm -hmm. she had just gotten back from my corporate headquarters for training, and she hadn't been paid. Mm -hmm. And I'm almost 100% positive that she had to quit that job because she could not afford or could not get the payday because she had no money. And she was already in debt. So when you talk about, and I've seen this before, by the way. This is an example that just, just happened on my job. Mm -hmm. But I've seen this before where black people, when you're, you're in financial straits, you need the job, but you can't even afford to actually participate or take advantage of the job. But, but, and let me, let me interrupt you for one second, Carla, because, and we talk about government. One of the things that hasn't happened in Atlanta that people, some people have tried and failed is like a, a metro system that goes everywhere, right? But that's, that's government. Yeah. Like people don't understand if you get, like when I worked in D.C., it was the same way. Like the, the, the parking was, was so expensive, it took like a humongous chunk out of your salary. But if you were able to yeah. catch the metro, the metro was, 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 was less expensive. But we don't even want to talk about the role of government and the role government plays in terms of figuring out how, whether or not we get a metro rail that goes everywhere that Negroes live, right? So I just wanted to put that out there. That's another example of like, if there had been a decent, if there had been a bus line that dropped right off in front of her house, or or, or a metro rail line near her house that she could walk to, that would have that would have decreased that amount. What it means is that she can't afford. Can't know twenty two dollars a day, twenty two dollars a day, five days a week. Come on. Yeah. Oh, thanks, great. Oh, you're just saying everyone in the office. I mean, everybody's complaining. Like for the first of my life, I take Marta, but. 
I can drive to Martin Park. I didn't know, I mean, literally I knew her one day. But I just want to just suppose this. Mm-hmm. So where she sat was behind the German guy that I talked about earlier, the German, okay. like, second generation migrant. Well, he has money. And I talked to him, he's super cool. He lived with his parents, went to Auburn, blah, blah, blah. The same time she was complaining about paying $22 a day and talking to a debt collector, he was buying a $600 ticket for the Auburn versus Washington game at the Mercedes-Benz Stadium for the upcoming football season. Because I, I walked by and I said, what you getting me? Are you getting tickets for the season? He goes, no, that's one ticket. Let me say that again. She's complaining, crying about $22, yeah. and he's buying a $600 football ticket for one game. When I tell you it's such a stark difference in resources, yeah, with the with the with, yeah with the designated bottom. Everybody see. In order for America to work, somebody has to be on the bottom. This country doesn't work if nobody's on the bottom. Capitalism doesn't work if there's no bottom. And what they've decided is that we're gonna put black people on there. We're gonna make up this thing called race, and we're gonna say that these people who are who are brown, who come from slaves, are like inferior, and like the men are rapists, and we're gonna make up this whole thing about them, and we're gonna use that to put them on the bottom in order to make America work. And so it doesn't matter. That, so you have this German person that you work with who can buy a $600 ticket, and the, and the girl can't buy $22 a day, and that's what it takes to be American now. To be American, you gotta be able to drop 22 a day and not even worry about it. But we don't have it because of historic reasons. And white people own those parking lots and don't want a metro. They own those parking lots, right? And they don't want a metro. They own those parking lots. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. No, 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 no. I was actually, I'm sorry. I was just agreeing with you that, and I think that what people don't understand when they don't quite understand, like you're, and they say you're being negative, I don't think they understand how often that happens. Where somebody can't front when they're working for a company. I've seen this where they can't pay, like you just got to pay your expenses. Oh, we're going to send you for training. We're going to do X, Y, and Z. You just got to pay your expenses and get reimbursed. If you don't have the money to get reimbursed, Oh, that's happened to me. That, that happened to me. That's happened to me on jobs. That's happened to me on jobs. Like I, but I've always been a little squirrel running around with every little nut I can find, and not buy nothing. But it's happened to me. I go places when I was in my career early on, and like, well, you know, you got to fly here, and we'll reimburse you. What the hell I'm gonna do till I get reimbursed? I ain't making no money here. But everybody else, like. Everybody else gets to have these in vivo transfers, too. Like, even when I was young and I was working on Capitol Hill, you see a lot of these white people who, like, well, my mom sent me this and my dad sent me that, and I got this money from this one, I got this money from granddad, and, well, for Christmas, grandma, and all this stuff. And you're like, well, what the hell? Man, that's, that's the thing that makes it possible. That's the thing that makes their lives possible. But it don't make our lives possible. That don't happen in our lives. We don't get those in vivo transfers. And even our people who have it, like, I, even the boomers who have it, they're not trying to give it to us in life and pass it down. That's something that needs to start happening, too. We need to start having conversation with these boomers. Hey, we, what's the wheel look like and when you coming up off that money? I, need, I don't need no transfer after you die. I need stuff right there to make my life possible. Because that's what white people are doing. No, you don't get to go buy a Harley. You don't get to go start a new family somewhere. You don't get to go be happy. You get to pass this down right now. Let's talk about how you're going to do that right now. And we don't want to have that uncomfortable conversation. We like to say, well, it's day money. No, in what world? Everybody's living off everybody's living off multi-generational money now. Ain't nobody living off their own money now. You're gonna tell them, well, it's day money, I'll make my own money. Good luck. Sorry, Carl, I'm gonna let you finish. And, 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 no, no, and you're right. Just to add up to that that I'm done, is that so the German guy, just to let you know, part of it, just you know, having conversation, exactly what you said about everyone's eating off or they're living off of the wealth from the previous generation. The reason why he has the money in the bank, the reason why he has money, he said when he graduated from college, he stayed home, didn't have one bill, his parents paid for college, he said every job went in the bank. So he's 27 going on 28, and he regularly buys $600 tickets to go to his SEC football game. And he's looking to buy a home in Brookhaven, and he's looking, I mean, Brookhaven. $400,000. Brookhaven. And I'm telling you. See, people don't know what, when you talk about, tell them what you said again about how much I, see, I'm, I'm from here, I know how much a house costs in Brookhaven. Tell them, tell them again how much a house costs in Brookhaven. 400000 plus. And this is a 27-year-old young, uh, young man, this is a German guy, and he literally is like, it's an investment, I have a roommate, my roommate can pay half the mortgage, 
I'll probably put between 80000 and 100000 down, but he easily has that in the bank. So when I'm telling you real life, I'm looking at this black girl, and I'm looking at this white guy, and what it means to have parents that come from something. So when I tell you what you said, what you're saying is so spot on. Like, people need to understand they've got to change what they're doing because you are not going to make it. You cannot afford life. You, you're not going to be able to afford to be safe, to be in safe neighborhoods. You're not going to be able to afford life. So I, I'm agreeing with you. Thank you, Carl. a great example. You talked about we're the same, but when I tell you we're not the same and the mm -mm. struggle is weird, I mean weird, real for black people, it really is that more people need to listen, wake up, and understand that we've got to work together, get our politics together, and kind of change how we move. Or like you said, we will be priced out of America yeah. and we will not survive. Because thank you, Carla. I appreciate it. But you, you exactly right. That was a great example. That was a great example. Because what happens is these people are tied to the New Deal. See, the New Deal, people talk about, well, we don't want protectionism. We had some immigrants then, yeah, but we didn't have anything. Like, you saw this with the Immigration Act of 65, with 65 and then with the black immigrants you saw it in 1980. You had basically a protectionist sort of thing. Companies that weren't able to leave, and there were not a bunch of immigrants coming in, and we were tied to this whole FDR. A lot of these people who were in the New Deal, right? Who got benefits from the New Deal? They're still tied to that when America was booming and America was making money, and their their grand granddaddy or great granddaddy was making money. That's what they're tied to. That's what they're connected to that makes their lives possible. They're getting in life in vivo transfers of wealth to make their lives possible. And our people don't either either don't have wealth or you have somebody who has wealth, who is a boomer who has wealth, and they're trying to spend all the wealth on themselves before they die. And everybody living longer than they used to live. So you got a boomer who's just like, well, I'm going to do this. I'm going to go here. You can't spend this up before you die. That's not how this works. You better give that up. It's not how it works. We just let people, well, it's their money. It's not my money. So if they want to spend it, no, you brought me here. Do you understand that you people either had me or you had my mom and daddy? You brought me here. You can't bring me into this life and then just tell me I'm on my own. What's wrong with you? When everybody's, even these white people's out here living on their grandmama and, and mom and them uh, in, in life transfers to make their life possible. People are living on intergenerational money now. Ain't nobody living on individual money that's built during this lifetime. This is, this is multi-lifetime money now. You better start having a very difficult conversation. It's going to make a lot of people uncomfortable. You got to have a conversation. You got to have it with your siblings, with your mom and them, with your grandma and them. You got to have these conversations. I remember I had a, a friend a while back who, who, was, 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 who got upset with me because her mom was living in a, um, a house that was in a gentrified. It was her house in a gentrified neighborhood. I don't know. Y'all don't know. Like Midtown. Like, well, further up Midtown, like maybe the Moreland area. But turned into like this all white stuff and like i was like you need to talk to your grandmama about what she gonna do with this house well that's not mine what are you talking about like like what do you mean like you're doing all this stuff for your family and all this stuff and you don't want to have a conversation and i think those of us who don't want to have a conversation are going to have a, a, a hard road to go you know you know protectionism is real like for trump isn't the first person to kind of like lock the american door and we should think about how we're impacted by locking that door Especially in a, in, a, in a shrinking economy with fewer jobs, more mechanization. Why would you, within that, kind of, in that, in that shrinking economy, not a booming economy, want to invite more immigrants in to compete with your kids who already have limited opportunities and are already on the designated bottom? What sense does that make? So anyway, I'm going to the next call. Um, 470, I'm coming to you. 470, what's your name? Where you calling from? What's on your mind? Yes, hello. Hi, Sister Cornell. I appreciate your work. Thank this you. This is Sahara Zar calling from Atlanta, Georgia. Okay. Hi. 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 Um, I've been watching you um, recently new to your show. I was advised by my better half to, you know, Good. get to watching you. I do, um, yeah, he's, he's, he's an advocate. That's a good name. <laughs> I appreciate him <laughs> putting me on to you. But I I do have to just go into the Al Sharpton bit. Okay. We all know Al Sharpton as well as the rest of a couple of black um, coons, I will call them. Um, they sold us out years ago, all the way back to the beginning of the revolution with Martin, with Malcolm. And piggybacking off of the brother from New York, 
a lot of um, black politicians, people in power, from the Senate all down to the councilmen in our cities and our states, they want to eat off the, the white people's tables, basically getting the crumbs. Okay, and we have to realize that a lot of people in our communities, I have friends, colleagues, people years and years down the line, that once I change my, my, my mind frame, and start becoming more political because it's going to be a spiritual and political war mm. to change our people. I mm. appreciate the work you do, mm. but a lot of those are willingly being ignorant. You see, I have, as as they say in a so-called Jean, King James Bible, people turn on you when you, even though you're doing good works and you're trying to fight for your people, or with the, you know, in a sense, overthrow the government and change the government for our betterment, they turn on you. So yeah. we have to accept that there's going to be people of our color that is willfully going against us because they're comfortable in the space that they in. After civil rights, what leaders do we really have? You know, and, and black folks not understanding or African descendants is not understanding that we all as individuals must become leaders to make a difference. No, I agree. Okay, and we I have agree. to also realize. Go ahead. No, I said I agree. Continue, finish your point. I'm sorry. Right, and I want you to just speak to, if you can, for me, um, address the issue. You know, we are fighting against um, immigration. Of course, I'm with you one thousand percent, and I will follow you to no end. Um, but we have to address with the Fourteenth Amendment. That we are still considered second class citizens, Ms. Carnell. And under the Colonization Act, we're still under colonial rule. So I don't know who's listening, which I see you have many followers, over almost 2,000 right now live. We need lawyers, we need activists, not the ones in Congress, the bootleggers. They're not on our side. We need someone that's going to fight to amend this constitution to first make us citizens. We, we, we are citizens. Thank you, Carla. I, I, I got to go to the next one, but I appreciate you. We, we are citizens. Like, I, I, I understand people get into that. Um, um, but one of the things that she said that was, that was very important, I, I, think, I think a lot of us who, who, who kind of understand life and kind of understand things and understand politics, I think you have to, I think you have to be prepared to, why this thing shakes out? I think you have to be prepared to be kind of lonely um, or find your community here because it's going to be difficult and people are going to get to a point to where it's going to be difficult to deal with them because I've said this before on the show, um, but it's going to be difficult to deal with them because they're going to want you to deal with their individual problems when they run into race problems, lineage problems, which, which is what they really are because we know race is a con. When they run into the consequences of being you know, black American DOS, they're going to want your help, but they don't want to do anything systemically. So I think what you're going to run into is that these people are like, you're going to see a lot of wild people doing wild things when, when all of this Trump and these welfare cuts come and they're going to come to you. And I think, you know, speaking of isolationism, just on a personal level, you're going to have to make a lot of decisions that you may not be comfortable with as we try to move towards something more meaningful, just to protect yourself, you know, in terms of the kind of collectivism that we mean, doesn't mean that you can't have st standards in terms of how you deal with people and how you interact with people to protect yourself. To protect yourself and your own mental, you know, fortitude and your own mental health. Because these people, a lot of these people are just going to go crazy. Because they don't know how to frame any of what's happening. They don't even, like you're going to have people who don't even know that like all these cuts are coming down. And then they're going to come down, well, auntie, well, uncle. Well, you know, neighbor, what are you? Well, I, I told you, well, I know, but now it's here. Well, you know, you got to deal with your food box. I don't know what to tell you. I told you we should go down here and we should be advocating here. And now your food box is here. Please enjoy your can of salted green beans. I don't know what else to tell you because you don't want to do anything systemically. And that's the only space where it can be done systemically. It can't be done individually. It just can't. And you have to, you have to kind of be your own leader in the consequence of like being your own leader. So I'm going to 757. What's your name? Where you calling from? What's on your mind? What's up, Yvette? How you doing? What's going on? It's Otis. What's going on, Otis? What's on your mind? Look, I, 
I'm going to try to shift gears a little bit and try to keep it short and sweet. Okay. Our people get caught up in a whole lot of emotion. And we get tempted by a lot of people like uh, Elijah Cummins and Mr. Lewis who had crocodile tears. Oh, I saw him crying. At the border. Now, I, I want to tell you, I've had Spanish friends for 40 years. And I love them just like I love my family. But we have to understand that everything in America is about the potential for profit. Yeah. And they give us all of our profit and prosperity and prophecy of getting it in the next light. Let me say something to you. The Border Patrol, ICE, $7.6 billion a year. When, when for 10 years I've known advocates out, out in the Southwest that have advocated for families being broken up the whole time Obama was in office. Mm. The thing was, he was the one that allowed private prisons, the GO company, and Core Civic to be the ones to handle these migrants. That's what they keep calling them illegal aliens. I'm going to tell you the truth, and you touched on it early on. They're refugees. And it's a fallout for what Hillary Clinton has done. You touched on it with Honduras, yeah. Nicaragua, Uruguay. The only South American country that doesn't have that problem is Costa Rica, and they're the only country that rejected all of the interference for the last 30 years. Mm. So that tells you that what you said in the beginning of the program is 100% true. Now, here's what I'm going to say to you. We get caught up in emotions, and we have our gatekeepers, like Cummings and Lewis, who aren't going to jeopardize themselves, but they'll march out and get in front of the, get some camera time, just like Joy Reid them did this week, and, and all of the Democratic uh, representatives did. They've got to go down and see for themselves what's going on. They're the ones that appropriate the money for that. They know exactly what's going on. And they understand it's about money. Yep. Over $3 billion a year to process these people. But here's what I'm going to say to you. Mm. What they won't tell you is, guess what happened when this started? For years, they couldn't get any money to support some of these places that have been defending these people voluntarily, pro bono. So yeah. guess what happened? What happened? As soon as they found out that sympathy is turning on Trump, they used that 10 days to get $20 million I to invest money into defending these people. I saw that. I so saw that. I saw it on... That it's been working. Mm -hmm. Pardon me? No, I, said I saw that on... I was watching the Rachel Maddow show. I was getting ready for a show one night, and I had that on, and I saw that. Now, let me tell you, and, and I, I talked to one of your followers, uh, Yolanda uh, Sykes. This is all about money, and what I get upset about is we have to do another thing you touched on. We have to be willing to get rid of the gatekeepers. I put Maxine in there with them. I mm. put Cummings. I put Barbara Lee. Did you see Barbara Lee on one of the, the shows when she should have been talking about us and what's going on with in Flint, what's going on in Baltimore, how come you can have black uh, attorney generals and prosecutors that can't get somebody convicted for killing a man that's totally unarmed four times trying to try the co-defendant because he they wanted to lock him up because mm. he was an accessory mm. to someone else who pulled the trigger. She's going to try him four times, mostly in Baltimore, but she couldn't be, couldn't convict the cops who killed Freddie Gray. So well, I, I think I think I think I think Mosley I think Mosley actually I think Mosley I think she actually tried I think I think I think she tried but I think the police I think the co police were very conspiratorial like they were doing everything from hiding evidence and all kinds of stuff was going on it's I, 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 you but you're yeah. right but you're right in terms of your point now here's the other thing I'll say to you uh, I told you before I'm not that tech savvy but we have to really get on this thing about getting the Breaking Brown Army together and start hashtagging some of these people. Because another follow-up report, but Sewell, Terry Sewell, them down in mm -hmm. Loudoun County, okay. they haven't done anything for those people yet with the hookworms. And we have a, a UN council that's meeting now talking about that very same report. And mm. what happened when the report came out? Uh -huh. Nikki Haley says, that she doesn't think they have a right to be talking about Is that right? in America. Is that oh, right? I put up a post, a follow-up on that, and I actually got in touch with the uh, lady who started it, Catherine, Col uh, Catherine Coleman uh, Flowers. Okay. She actually moved back down there 
to start helping with getting this taken care of. And they've only helped 40 families out of that whole county. And I'm telling you, if we could get it started with, with just the hashtag that we did when you first brought it up, uh -huh. if we coordinate some Brig and Brown family and start hitting these people, we can draw them out to the light. Because okay. I'm sick and tired of the gatekeepers, and I'm going to tell you, it's too much money involved in it. And the other thing I'm going to say, to show you how slick Trump is, he set this thing up, he created the problem, then the supposed fix is now he's going to put these people on army bases. Guess why he's putting them on army bases? What's going because on? Because army bases, once you put them under Homeland Security, it's like Guantanamo. they have no access to the court system. He's going to keep them indefinitely and ends up, the uh, only ones that win are the pr private prison people. We have to get savvy to what's going on here. The other thing I was going to say, the gentleman that said Al got his job because of, I can't even remember all the details he said. No, Byron Allen actually pushed that out and explained it, and I said it once before on one of your uh, earlier broadcasts. Comcast put Al there as part of an agreement when Al went before the FCC and testified that Comcast, uh, in their acquisition, yeah, with was that not the rule. Mm -hmm. They actually brought Al out, so that's why he got there. And the other thing is, Al has been a childhood prodigy. He actually started out with Mahalia Jackson. I'm old enough to, to remember that. He actually started going around with Mahalia, Mahalia Jackson preaching at nine years old. So his thing is he's been there forever, telling the same lies and using the Bible. Yeah, but don't nobody care. I don't like, care. Like, like I don't think I don't I don't I don't even I don't care. He was with James Brown. I don't care that he was with Mahalia. Like, go sing then. Go sing Precious Lord if that's what you do. Like, go do that. Don't 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 try to be doing over here. Yeah, but I mean, I, I thank you, Otis. I appreciate it. We'll I will get up on the on the on the stuff you're talking about with Sewell. I'll look into that tomorrow. So on a closing note. Uh huh. On a closing note, I agree with the guy. Know your limits. Get out when you know your hand over your head. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I run. If I'm in my, I'm in my head, I got, I got, I got to live to fight another day. <laughs> Thank you, all this. I appreciate you. I appreciate you. It's a lot going on. Oh, it's a lot going on. We don't, and ain't nobody that advocates for us talking about none of it. We just out here scrambling. That's what we should call ourselves. Just, just the scrambling, just the scrambling Negroes. We just be scrambling for everybody, anybody, whatever. What we got to do today, boss? Ain't that what Al say? Anyway, I'm going to uh, 626. 626, I'm coming to you. What's your name? Where you calling from? What's on your mind? Hey, how you doing, Yvette? This is uh, JT calling out of Pasadena, California. What's going on? What's what's on your mind? Yeah, you know what? Um, you you definitely um, hit it on the head with me in terms of the uh, you know bringing in these immigrants because I work in uh, information technology in a very profitable company here, and I work with the H one H one B visas daily, and. Um, at first appearance, I, I, I definitely look like, a, you know, a descendant of a slave, but at first appearance, I kind of do have like an Ethiopian or half Indian kind of look up and told uh -huh. by some of them, but once I tell them I'm 100% DOS, you know, the conversation is completely changed up. Mm. But, um, anywho, um, I just kind of wanted to hit on what you said in terms of we've got a we got to hit these uh, boomers up. Uh, I, li I live in L.A. I've looked at, um, you know, a lot of your data and, and Tone's data. My parents are some of those boomers that are just kind of just sitting on a bunch of cake, sitting on real estate, and it's like nothing's falling. It, 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 yeah. just, it just happens so that, you know. And, and let, me just say this, let me just say this, Carla. Let me just say this, Carla. Wealth, okay. wealth okay. flows down. Mm -hmm. Wealth don't flow up. Right. See, boomers have done a done a right. number on us for making us feel like everything has to flow up. Well, what are you giving your? What are you giving yeah. us? What are you giving? Uh, what have you contributed to your to your parents or your grandparents? No, wealth flows down. So what? Why am I dry? Yeah. It's supposed to be water flowing on me, like water well. Why am yeah. I dry? Negroes be out here dry, and they be out here taking trips and doing all kind of stuff, taking second mortgages. You don't like you don't. You gotta tell them you don't get a second mortgage. You this is over for you. You don't get a second. You don't get to remortgage this house. This is supposed to be my life. What are you doing? No. Exactly. And I see it. I see it because, like, their na their neighborhood is kind of going through, like, the uh, gentrification of sorts. Uh, and the Australians and, and, you know, the white folks are trying to kind of start to buy up their neighborhood, which was a predominantly, like, black.
backside of Altadena or Pasadena for decades. Mm-hmm. And uh, their their home, my parents' home, has just got evaluated for like one point six million. I'm sorry. I'm and sorry. What? Wait, 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 wait. Yes. How much? <laughs> Do you have any siblings? Uh, Do you have any siblings? Yeah, yeah. I got. Uh, it's myself, and uh, we have two uh, two older siblings. Ah, okay. You know, and it just it just that's again, three thirty three and a third. We're kind of like anomaly. You know. Yeah, but that's three thirty three and a third. Three thirty three and a third. Everybody gonna look alive. Exactly. exactly. But it's funny because they don't see, they don't think that we need the help. And I'm telling my mom and my dad all the time, we're just anomalies. Like you, you just have three uh, kind of anomaly kids that are just happen to be kind of doing halfway good. But there's no cushion. You know, there's no cushion, and. Like, we're not, you know, no one's getting heavily promoted at the job. I got, my best friend is a, uh, check this out, a pharmacist, a brother who's a pharmacist. Myself, I'm a project manager, and my other best buddy is a web developer. And we're all kind of doing, you know, pretty decent in our field. But I noticed a pattern where we're not really getting promoted, too. Mm. Like, we have not gotten promoted in a good, like, five or six years versus, like, our peers, of uh, uh, other Crayolas, you know, other colors. Everybody in the yin yang, you know, up the yin yang is getting uh, promoted. But uh, uh, but uh, but um, I just wanted to tell you, nah. thank you for uh, continuing to do your show. No, thank you. And, I appreciate um, it. I appreciate you sharing your experience and like what your parents have to do too. Like if if one of y'all want to buy a house right now, and y'all start a family. Like, why y'all ain't take no equity out of that house or whatever y'all got to do to, to give us a down payment or whatever? You don't get just to sit on that until you until you dead. Right. You got to make that happen. Right. Like, and it's three of y'all. Y'all get enough of y'all to gang up. Like, that's all I'm saying. <laughs> like, you have, to get, you have to get with your siblings and be like, what do we all need? What do we all need? Like, were you yeah. trying to buy a house? Is you trying to make an investment? What do we all need? Because these people will sit on this stuff and they'll be living their life. And then they, you wait till they die and then you'll die and find out that they did this and they leverage it this way. And you have to have them conversations. Like, let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. Because you're going to need... You're going to need... Yeah, because you got to talk about it because you're going to need me too. Like, you're going to need me too. Like, don't act. Don't act. Because you might end up in a nursing home or something. So you need me to be here. I need you to be here. Let's let's talk about this exchange. Like, we don't... Like, this is a conversation that white people have all the time. Like, white people decide early on how they're going to do it. And how they're going to structure their family. And how they're going to use their leverage as, as, as like, and weaponize their leverage over their kids. They make their kids, you're going to do what I say in order to get this stuff. We have, we, we just let our parents and grandparents just go and they, they do anything. They'd be at the Essence Festival. They'd be, they be goddamn 60 years old buying Harleys and you need to be just like, and, and I'm going to start a new family. No, you're not. I will, I will beat you in the street. You're not going to start nothing. You're not going to start nothing. That's mine. That's mine. And now, we don't want to have that conversation though. We believe that like that's their money. No, it's not. That's not how life works in America. Not now. It's not a time where you can just build your own self up. Everybody, if you, if we're living in a time where white people are living multi generationally, what do you think that means for you? For the people who are lucky enough, most people don't have nothing. But if you're lucky enough to have a boomer that's got some money, what do you think that or a house that's like one million? What do you think that means for you? That means you gotta you gotta walk behind them and follow them. Where you going? What you doing? You finna spend something? You can't spend nothing. It's mine. <laughs> what you doing? So thank you, Carla. I appreciate it. I appreciate that. Yeah, I mean, I don't understand what people are doing, but nobody wants to confront anybody. Boomers are real good to walk around and be like, I don't know what you're talking about. It's not your buddy. You try to count my money. Child, everybody, you better get yourself, you better get your life right. And come. You better go back inside and come back out with a different point of view. Anyway, I'm going to think I'm going to take two more callers. The first one I'm coming to is 713. Uh, 713, what's your name and where are you calling from? Hey, Yvette, this is Nathan. I'm calling from Texas. How are you? Pretty good, Nathan. How you doing? I'm doing well. Um, I just wanted to talk about, I'm, I'm so glad you brought this topic up, especially with Al, you know, Al Sharpton. Um, I don't know if you saw the news the other day, John Lewis had actually, uh, there was an article where he was saying that he was going to go to jail for uh, the kids who had, you know, been detained. Oh, child, lock like him up. And, you know, I'm just, I'm just so done. You know, I just want to shout out Mr. Otis because I'm like, a lot, we need to just like do a purge of a lot of these politicians. Like, it's just time for a lot of the older ones to just sit down. Um, and, you know, 
just kind of following this whole thing for the last two weeks. It's like I feel sorry for those children, but then I, yeah, I find it insulting when you come back and try to tie in what's going on with what has happened to us as descendants of slaves and then Jim Crow and then yeah. mass incarceration and all this other stuff. You know, we, we really didn't get rights until like the 1970s. Um, I mean, when you really, really look at it, and even then, as, as Jim Crow ended, like I say, mass incarceration started. So you have a point, like, he has been on our neck since the very beginning. And for these people to come in, and it's like, for them to try to compare other people's struggles to ours and tell us that we have to have sympathy and feel sorry, because they're, they're, they're really appealing to emotion. It's not a politics yeah. based on justice. Of course. Y'all know that. Right? Of course. So for them to come in and tell us that, you know, we have to, like, feel sorry for these people. I don't mean to sound cold, but it's like I'm just very numb. I can't feel anything. And it's not that I'm a heartless person, but number one is like I look at my own community and what's been done to us. There was a black teenager who just got killed by a police officer, shot in the back multiple times. They said he was running a few days ago in Pittsburgh, and you haven't heard anything about that because the news has had this whole... Yes, you know, all 24-7. Crisis. You can't even... Like the news is on... Listen, the, like, you, like you just said, Carla... The news is unwatchable right now. Like, the only thing we're talking about on the news no. is these... First, I thought it was going to go away after Trump came out with the executive order, let's put the migrants and their mamas and Why? whatever back. But then after that, it's still 24-7 migrant news. Think about, when have we ever had that? The only thing close to that was maybe Trayvon Martin. But we never had somebody just 24-7 going to bat for us as a group. No, you're absolutely right. And you know what? You know, I, I, I hate to say this because I, am, I, I have respect for our elders. But I even look at elders in my own family who are just glued to the television about what's going on. Yeah. And honestly, I've had to say to them, and you know, I use my breaking brown talking points because you have shaped, you have like altered the way that I see politics. Thank you. And one of the things that I say is, have y'all noticed that there's not, there's never been this type of reaction for the things that have been done to black people. Nobody looks at black people in the same way that you view these migrants. And I'm not knocking the migrants because we're all humans. We all deserve to be treated equally. But I'm just saying, Reggie, called, Reggie from Boston called in not too long ago, and something that he said has just stuck with me, that it's almost like they're humanizing them while simultaneously dehumanizing us. And, that, and, I don't think and, you, and you're right, Carla. Let me just say, let me just, let me, let me, let me make one correction. We don't all deserve to be treated equally. They deserve to be treated humanely. They deserve to be treated humanely, but you're not equal to me. I'm sorry. And people can be mad. You're not equal. You deserve it, but you deserve to be. I don't want you to be mistreated. You deserve humane treatment. That's what I'm for. I'm for a humane treatment for you as a migrant immigrant who came here illegally. But you don't deserve, you don't deserve to be equal to me as a citizen who, who, who has ancestors who built this country with free labor. You, you, we're not the same. But go on. I'm going to let you finish your point. I'm sorry. Because all have the same fate. So we haven't had the same shared history in this country. You're absolutely right. I thank you for that. You know, and I mean, it's just like, you telling me to feel sorry for people, you know, when in my daily interactions with people, you know, just, just where I live, it's like Mexicans, some Salvadorians and Guatemalans. It's like, they're, I mean, not all of them. I'm not talking about all of them, but a lot of them are very racist towards, you know, black American DOS. And I think a lot of this, a lot of what you see with Al Sharpton just kind of sheds light on the fact that I think a lot of our black baby boomers and, you know, the, the younger members of the silent generation in the black community, they also need lineage therapy. I think that this whole concept of the need for lineage therapy doesn't apply to young black people. It's the older black people, too. Because how can you sit there having lived through Jim Crow? You know, some of y'all have grandparents who might have been born into slavery or at least during reconstruction. And then you're going to say that people who are breaking the law are in the same in the same situation as us, what laws did we ever break? I'm yep. sorry. And then on top of that, like I, like I was thinking that before, I live in a place where in interacting with a lot of these people, they're very racist toward black DOS. And so y'all don't have a clear conception of who you are, but yep. you also don't understand how race works in Latin America because a lot of people who are coming here are coming here from countries where they're identified as mestizos. And so in Latin America, the race, the one drop rule, you could say that it works in, it basically works in reverse. So if you have a little bit of white ancestry, you can identify as white. Mm. That means that many of these people are coming here and they're aspiring to whiteness. So catch this. And they get that too. They get it. They get to be white. They're not just aspiring. They get to be white. They get it and we don't. That's yep, the thing. Nope. They get it and we don't. If in two generations they become white, yep. tell me how in two generations we can become white. We've been here for centuries. I got 
you know, I just did my ancestry DNA. Um, I've traced my family lineage. I have ties to like sugar and rice plantations in South Louisiana and Southeast Texas and in the Carolinas. I've been here since, my family's been here since at least the early 1800s. I haven't been able to become white. So how is it that these people who can come here and become white and then turn around and treat us the same way that they perceive how white people treat us are in the same boat as us? And why would you? And, but, and the question is, and why would you invite that? Like, if you know that's how it's gonna end, we have enough evidence to know how this ends. If you if you know that's the end game, because nobody wants to come to America to join a losing team, and we are the losing team. If you know that's how it ends, why would you advocate for them to come? And it, the thing is, it, it's upsetting because I, it, it seems like everywhere I go, I see so many of our black talking heads, like you know, standing up and just trying. I guess what they perceive as fighting is a good fight. But it's like, nobody's actually speaking for us. No. Nobody's speaking for us. I, like I told you before, I want to feel sorry for people, but I just don't have the bandwidth when I look at what's going on in my community. And then when I look at how a lot of immigrants treat us, you know, I was in a store not too long ago, and this woman, I, basically I was going to like grab something off the shelf. I didn't even see her coming. But anyway, I grabbed it off the shelf, and she got upset. I guess she thought that I was trying to get it before her. And she said in Spanish to the person who was next to her, I'm... Um, it, 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 it's, a, it's a curse word, so please don't, you know, be offended. But basically, she said it's a pinche mayate. Well, pinche means the F word, and mayate is like a, it's like a Mexican slang for basically like the N word. But they use it to refer to black Americans, you know. How oh. am I supposed to feel sorry for people when that's how I get treated in my daily interactions with them? Mm. I, just, I don't have the bandwidth. I'm sorry. I don't, you know. None of us had a bandwidth for what we're going through. I don't know what else I'm talking None of us do. None of us do. None of us do. You're drowning talking about, I want to save that person over in the corner. How? You're drowning. Save yourself. Then, you know, I, another thing that I noticed is how, like, with this whole immigrant crisis, now you see them trying to revoke the whole legacy of slavery. Yeah. But to my question to people like Al Sharpton and John Lewis and Joy Reid is, don't y'all notice that, like, they only acknowledge the atrocities that have happened to African people, specifically in this case, black DOS in the United States, when it suits their political narratives. Yeah, Like, I came course. across the post on Facebook the other day. I'll read it to you. It was by, and I'm going to call a woman out. Her name was Laura Parrott Perry. And she says, quote, That's not amazing. sure a country that has a history of selling babies away from their parents in slavery, get this, sending native children to boarding schools and separating families in Japanese internment camps is to clutch its invisible pearls and cry, this is not who we are. It's who we've always been. She's absolutely right. But catch this. When she talked about them selling babies away from their parents in slavery, notice there was no handle in front of babies. She didn't talk about what kind of babies those were. Yeah, just a little baby. And so I think that we just need to be very... No, nobody wants to say, like, this is what happened to black people, basically. So I think that we just need to be very careful, you know, with, with using our political capital to kind of, like, align with all of these people because ultimately what's going to happen is they're erasing, they're erasing what we're owed. We yeah, we only have, have like, the, the thing is, the thing it, is. It's more than a coincidence that, like, all of these black, you know, talking heads in the media and in Washington are, you know, just pretty much not advocating for us. They're not doing our bidding, like John Lewis. They're not doing our bidding. It's no coincidence. Now, I could be wrong, but I just have a feeling that they've seen the light and they see where things are going. I do, we too. Don't. I do, too. They see, they see we finna be finished. They see we finna be finished. Anyway, I just, I, I'll just just in there because I could keep on going. But I do want to say thank you so much. Thank like, you. Your show is awesome. Thank you. Um, I've been following you for a long time. And I just, you have just, like, changed the way that I think about politics. And I'm just so grateful. Like, please. Thank you. I appreciate group. that, bro. I, I really appreciate that. I do. In my own little corner of the YouTube, <laughs> I try to do what I can. I, I really do appreciate that. But, like, I mean, he's right. Like, you know, one of the things that I deal with. Or that I understand when I wake up in the morning. Is that I'm a human being. And I only have so much energy. So the stuff that's most important to me. I put it earlier in the day. Before afternoon. Like usually one of the first things I do is I work out. Because I want to try to maintain my health. That's the, one of the only things I can do. And so it's, it's imperative to me. You work out and shower and you read. And then, like the stuff that I do, if it's a show day, then okay, I got to go prepare the notes for the show and all this stuff. So it's, it's like the stuff that's, that's most important to me comes first. 
And I'm always cognizant of the fact that I, I'm human and I, I, I don't have an infinite amount of energy. So at a certain point, I'm going to get tired. So I have to prioritize. Like, but it's, it's, as, as a group, as like black American descendants of slaves, it's almost as if we're not cognizant of the fact that like, we only have so much political capital. And the bulk of that political capital has to be used for us. We can't spread, spread that political capital to, to, to the Hondurans and El Salvadorians and, and Mexicans and women and the white women and the Me Too and all this stuff. And, and, and there's only so much. And you're on the bottom. It's not even like if we were here, like we were, like let's say if we were here and like white people had 20% of the wealth and we had 10, we got half, but we moving. We got half of what they got. Then all these other migrants, maybe they got everything else. Or maybe white people got, you know, 40% and we got 30% and then, you know, that's 70. And then, you know, you got 30 that's got 30 people. And they's like, okay, well, we, we close. Like when you're on the dead bottom and you have some political capital left, that needs to be used for you. That needs to be used for us. I don't think we really understand that we're squandering everything we have. And for what? That, that these people have not taken an oath of allegiance to like native black DOS. So what are we doing? We're just acting on behalf of the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party just wants more votes. Just like the Republican Party just wants more cheap labor. They don't want these people to have a better life. They want these people to come here and be cheap labor in these factories for them. Nobody wants, nobody, none of these parties really want what's best for these people. They don't, they don't care. Like, do you think Hillary Clinton issued a statement or something or a Twitter tweet about immigration? Or like, you did what you did to Honduras. Give me a break, lady. Like, all these people, they don't care. Caring means fixing, fixing foreign policy. So, I'm going to go to the last call now. I'm going to um, 630. That's the, probably the last call tonight. 630, what's your name? Where are you calling from? What's, what's on your mind? Um, hi, this is, this is Sherry, and I'm in Illinois. Um, really enjoying the show tonight. I just wanted to make a few points that okay. uh, we really need to be more alert as uh, black Americans descendants of slaves. Because uh, it's not just that the, that, the, that the immigrants that are coming in or the illegals that are coming in are uh, kind of pushing us over, but they're actually kind of taking over our whole history and experience in, in a subtle way. Let me, just leave some, let me just leave some points with you. Okay. One of the points, the 14th Amendment. You know, the 14th Amendment was uh-huh. implemented on the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, implemented for the descendants of slaves. Okay. That's our birthright. That's, yep, our that's birthright. true. That's true. an American citizen. The illegals are the only other group that uses that. And it's not for them. Even even legal immigrants do not use the 14th Amendment for their children to be citizens. Only illegals, which is is very incorrect. Another thing that they that they do is uh, the, the the DACA recipients. What is what is their argument? Well, we've come here through no fault of our own. There's only one group of people that have come here through no fault of their own, and that's slaves. You know, uh, and another thing that they use is we've come here against our will. We're the only ones that have come here against yeah, even, our will. Even if you came here against your will, your mama or your daddy brought you. Or they paid a smuggler to bring you. That's not the right. same thing. Right. Uh, right. And then they march for civil rights. They're suing the government right now because of their civil rights. Uh, right. You know, they, they talked about it. hasn't been talked about a lot. But now they're talking about Juan Crow. Because of the immigration policies against them, they're calling it Juan Crow. Really? Yes, Juan Crow, Jim Crow, everything. We're the basis for everything. Everybody, everybody, everybody eats. Everybody, listen. We're the basis for everything. We like we shed blood. We gave blood for all of this. We paid the way for all these people to be here, and they're eating off of it. They're eating the fruit, but nobody's paying the cost. The cost is something that we bear, and we continually bear. We didn't just bear it back then. We're continually bearing the cost, and everybody's eating the fruit. Warren Crow, get the fuck out of here. Warren Crow, like I heard that too, and I was like, you got to be kidding me. Look it up. I saw it. I see. I just seen it the other night, and I was shocked. I wouldn't. Oh, you have seen it. Yeah, I have seen it, but I wasn't shocked. Yeah. Wow. Then, and then they separated. I swear to you, 
uh, that one of the advocates, I don't remember if it was an advocate, if it was a lawyer, I can't remember, but they shouted out, they need to, they need to return those children on Juneteenth. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> you know, associating the separating that they needed to, to return those children on Juneteenth. Because they're getting ready to celebrate Juneteenth. You know, and, and the thing that people don't understand, you think about these people, you think about us and the way we were treated. Uh, you, you know, uh, if, if, if a black person stole them, even if they didn't, they accused them and had them all packed and all over the news for years and years and years. And that just didn't turn other people against us. That turned us against us mm. and not trusting us. But these people come in and illegally, Still people's social security numbers, make up social security numbers, still IDs, and they're still good people. These are good people. These mm, are yeah. people. Nobody talks about nobody family. talks about that. Nobody yeah. talks about the fraud and all that. No don't nobody talk about that. Don't nobody talk about that at all. At all. No, 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 no. They're good people, you know. And and, and one more point I, I'd like to make is is, is is what people have to understand. The laws against these people are legal laws. They're the ones that are illegal. The laws that were against us were illegal, but we were legal people. That's the difference. Mm. Yeah. That's the total. That, that's so different. You know. So you know. Please, you, 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 black people have got to wake up. We must wake up. When we have these phrases, we need to down them right away. People of color. No, we were people of color because mm. within our culture, we had so many different cultures. But now they're using that people for color to anybody around white. Yeah, but it's, it's, with them. it's not no. Crayola anyway. Like, anybody can be brown. Like, it don't mean nothing. Like, all these Silicon Valley, like, all these Silicon Valley Indians and stuff like that, they brown, but they ain't hiring us. Like, anybody can be brown. This is about lineage. It's not about complexion. It's not about how you paint yourself. It's not about whether you're red, brown, or black. It's about lineage. How do you trace for your sure. lineage? For sure, but... But my point is, they have taken over that term, people of color. We may have used it way back, but it was before us because within us, there's so many colors. You know, we got the high yellow, we got the red, we got the brown, mm -hmm. we got the tan, we got the dark black, black. We had so many colors with us because remember, as you point out, it was at one time this country was mainly black and mainly white, you know? Mm -hmm. But now they have taken that term and now it's everybody. People of color, anybody not white, and, 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 and try and throw us right on the boat with these individuals. No. Try to throw me on the boat. She said, try to throw us right on the boat. They're going to put us on the boat. They're going to put us on the boat with them. They're like, go on. <laughs> I appreciate I, I agree. I appreciate you for calling. I appreciate you because I got I have to go. We 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 well over we two hours and fourteen minutes. I'm sorry, everybody. We're gonna have to. It's about time to wrap this up. People gotta go to bed. Go to work. We hitting on midnight. Y'all talk about all. Anyway, thank every. I want to thank everybody who who called in this evening. Um, I'm sorry. It's a it's one of them shows where the lines is lit up lit up all the way through. But I'm not gonna be able to get everybody in because, you know, it just it. It's just too much. But um, please like, please subscribe, um, please finish your libation and, and, and go to bed. <laughs> please hit the bell button to like get notified when I come on. Subscribe to brown.com. It's free. And you can just subscribe to like so I have your email address to your mailing list when I want to send something out. Thank you, everybody, for being a part of this conversation today. We have to continue this conversation in our own homes. If you cannot continue it in your home, I understand. If something happens, something pops off, and, and nobody wants to hear it. But understand this, when, 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 when they end up driving for whatever they got to drive for, and I'm not trying to say nothing negative about driving for Uber. We might all end up driving for Uber. But I'm just saying that, like, they destroyed labor law to make that possible and to put us in that position. So understand that you, if you drive for Uber or Lyft, I've taken Lyft before, Please understand, I'm not saying anything negative about you. I'm saying something negative about what America has done to you by putting you in a position where you don't have what you're supposed to have. It's nothing negative about you as an individual. That's what I'm saying. So um, enjoy your night, Breaking Brown family. We will be here again having this conversation very soon. Till next time.